Hello and welcome to this next in the classroom video where we are looking at the correspondence between the different books of the Bible as per uh, the book Metacosm which I wrote uh, between 2012 and 2020 and we've been going over how the Bible is perfectly structured in the order of books and how the order of books play out in three specific iterations and the first one as you can see here is Genesis through Esther and this is the history and so this is basically the history of Israel uh, starting from the creation all the way to um, Esther which is the 17th book of the history and then after the poetry interlude which is Job uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, you then come to the prophets, the section of scripture which is known as the prophets. And guess what? It's exactly 17 books again, Isaiah through Malachi. And then um, in the epistles after the gospel action where we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, which is the, the history of the gospel going out to the ends of the earth, then you have um, the epistles, which are again, I'm going to suggest are structured in an exact 17 stage pattern with um, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, um, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, <clears throat> and 1st and 2nd Peter. And then you have the last five books, 1st, uh, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Um, in a separate section according to the book. And so when we're looking at how these are in tandem with each other, that's what this series is about. So as you can see here, we have highlighted Leviticus and Lamentations, the third books of this particular series. And so it's the third book of the history and the third book of the prophets, Lamentations, written by Jeremiah. And so uh, we're going to see several things here, but the, the first thing is just a quick recap. If you recall that in Genesis, we saw how God's perfect creation was ruined by man's sin. And because of man's sin, um, it, Genesis ends with Joseph buried in a coffin in Egypt. And then um, he's embalmed, though, so it's a, it's a burial that's not without hope. There's a hope for a future resurrection. And of course, Exodus is a picture of how um, God sends them a savior. Israel has, has gone down into Egypt and they are now enslaved in, and in bondage to the death and decay and the slavery of the world under Pharaoh in Egypt, Pharaoh a picture or type of Satan. And he doesn't want to let them be set free from their bondage. He does not want to let them to go with Moses. And so, after all the plagues and everything that transpires with Moses and Pharaoh, eventually in Exodus chapter 12, we see that Israel gets led out by Moses. And of course, this is a picture of us, uh, because we each have our own personal genesis, where we come into this world, and since we came into this world through an earthly father, that earthly father passed the sin nature from our first father, Adam, down to us, and we are born in bondage to a mortal frame, to death and decay in this world. And so in the construct of this with Exodus, um, we don't get let out by Moses, but Moses was a type. He was a prefigure of Christ. And so we get let out by Jesus. Jesus is the one who leads us out. And as he leads us out of the world, of course, Satan doesn't want that to happen. That's why salvation is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult for somebody to come to salvation. And it actually speaks to uh, the curse in Genesis 3, when God is pronouncing the curse on the woman. And he says, in, in great pain shall you bring forth children, um, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Well, the whole aspect of pain in childbirth, it's a picture or it's a type. Um, of course, uh, women who give birth to children, of course, it, physically, it is a tremendous, um, tremendously p 
painful and difficult process, um, the birthing process to bring forth a child into the world. Um, and that is the natural picture. But the spiritual picture is that it's extremely difficult. It's with great pain um, and great sorrow and great difficulty that one comes into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and receives salvation. And that's why so many of us are perplexed that we try to share the gospel. We want, to, we want people to get saved. But we know that many of our family members, our friends, our colleagues, our co-workers, um, various people that we run into, we want to share the gospel with them. We want uh, them to receive salvation. But it's not easy because you have that bondage of flesh that that person is trying to cling to. And so as they do that, just remember that there's only one reason, one reason and one reason only, that people do not receive salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not because you didn't witness good enough to them, or you didn't pray hard enough for them, or because you didn't say just the right words and just the right scriptures at just the right moment. It's not because you weren't able to defend against evolution, or um, it's not because you weren't able to um, have all of your apologetics ready against all their arguments. Um, it's none of that. There's one reason and one reason only that people reject the gospel of salvation in Christ. And that reason is they love their sin. They love their sin. And so they might give you a whole bunch of other reasons like, oh, I think there's contradictions in the Bible. Oh, I think, um, you know, that uh, Jesus was a really good person, um, but, you know, he's just one of the great gurus, just like uh, Buddha and all the rest of them. So, um, or, oh, I think it's too narrow. There must be many ways to God, so I'll find my own way. Thank you very much. Or, um, I, I don't believe that the Bible has maintained its integrity through all the translations down through the centuries. Um, I think there's errors in it. Oh, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. So they'll give you a million excuses. But that's not why they're not receiving the gospel. The reason they're not receiving the gospel is because they love their sin and they don't want to give it up. And so that is why it is so difficult for people to get saved. And so for someone to be born again, just like a natural child, it's very difficult for a woman to bring forth a natural child into this world. Well, um, if you think of the woman, um, Israel, um, really in a sense, this, the spiritual mother of us all um, who believe in Jesus Christ, that was um, represented in the one person, the Virgin Mary, who brought forth the Christ um, into this world when she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and Christ came into this world and um, look what he had to go through, first of all. Um, so he had to go through his life of living a perfect life with um, not failing one single time, perfectly sinless. He was tempted directly by the devil himself in the wilderness. He lived a perfect life under the most excruciating circumstances and one of the most difficult times in human history. And then he had to go to the cross and not sin um, one time. He had no self-interest on the cross. He was only thinking of uh, you and I when he was on the cross and he did not think of himself. And so when he did all that, all of that uh, that he went through, the scourging, the beating, the mocking, the spitting, um, the uh, mocking of him by the religious leaders. Also, there's some indications in scripture that he was actually being mocked by the entire demonic world at that time. The strong bulls of Bashan, as you see in Psalm 22, uh, they're mocking him. And um, as he's going through that excruciating not to mention the pain, the physical pain of the crucifixion after the scourging, which was brutal. And you have all of that just to bring forth the opportunity to provide salvation uh, to everyone. But then after that, now you have everybody who wants to resist it. You know, they don't want to take that free gift because even though they're in a, in a doomed uh, condition in mortal frame, they love their sin so much that they don't want to receive that good news. And so it is with great difficulty that people get saved. 
Um, just like it's great difficulty that people come into this world in the natural, it's with great difficulty that people get born again in the spiritual. And so, um, once someone is born again, though, then that is represented here by this Exodus stage of life. And so in this Exodus um, stage of a spiritual progression of a believer's life, that's the, the getting saved part. Um, that's the part where you accept Christ and you let him lead you out of Egypt, so to speak. You come out of the world and you um, come into a relationship with him and he starts leading you. That's the whole point. And so what we're going to get into today is this next stage, the stage that Leviticus represents. And so many Christians are very confused by this because they're, they're thinking, well, what in the world does Leviticus have to do with me? That's just a bunch of strange Jewish religious practices and sacrifices and the whole sacrificial system and all these priests and what's going on with this? How does this relate to um, me as a Christian? Well, um, it relates in a number of ways, but one of the ways that it relates is um, the following. So, first of all, God did not save Israel, and we can use Israel as a prefigure or as a model, as a type of what we experience. So, God didn't save Israel out of Egypt just so that Israel could go build their own Egypt. Um, and the analogy that I often use is, um, you know, Israel did not cross the Red Sea, a picture of believer's baptism, and then right on the other side of the Red Sea, uh, build a McDonald's and a Starbucks, build a bridge over the Red Sea back to Egypt so they can go back anytime they want. And yet there was a desire for the Israelites to do such things. Of course, I'm using modern um, examples. But they wanted to do similar things. And very soon after they crossed the Red Sea and they were on the other side and Pharaoh was defeated, a picture of Satan being defeated and he can't touch your salvation anymore. Um, you're, you're free. You're on the other side. But what did they start doing? They started grumbling. They started complaining. They started saying, where are we going to get our next meal? We had it better in Egypt. It would be better if we were back there. You brought us out here to die. What, did, what in the world is going on? Well, this is a picture, the same exact picture um, of a Christian who comes to salvation and then they re they gladly receive it. They're excited about this new salvation, but then they're wondering, well, I still have this flesh, mortal frame body that I got to deal with, and I have desires, and I still have lusts, and I still have selfishness, and I'm still self-interested, and I still have these things. Well, that is what these next books are about. They're a picture of how God dealt with that in Israel, and it's a prefigure of how God wants to, us to deal with that in our personal lives. So first of all, in the first seven chapters of Leviticus, if you read it, you'll see that it talks about nothing but all of these offerings, and there's all kinds of offerings. There's the burnt offering, um, there's a free will offering, there is a grain offering, uh, there is a wave offering, and you, so you have all these different types of offerings. There's, there's actually five of them, and then there's different ways that they are instructed to um, execute these offerings to God. And so what they're all a picture of, all five of them, remember five, five is the number of grace, okay? Five is the number of grace in Scripture. And so there's five different offerings within the seven, first seven chapters of Leviticus. And so these five different offerings, you can go study each one. Each one is a picture or a type of the true sacrifice of Christ. See, Christ was the burnt offering. He's the one that's the sweet smelling. His sacrifice of giving his all, giving the whole essence of himself, him giving that up um, was a sweet smelling sacrifice to the Father. Uh, because he gave his all uh, for us. And so it pleased the Father, and it pleased him uh, to see that his son had given everything that, that he had, all his whole essence, he gave it on the cross. He left not one bit was left of, of his soul, spirit, self, his, his body, and everything, the essence of everything that he was, 
He sacrificed every last ounce of it for us. It's a picture of a burnt offering. Because in the burnt offering, the offering of the animal is wholly consumed. Um, every last bit of it is burnt up. And so it's completely consumed, just like Christ was completely consumed on the cross in the atonement for you and I. And so when you, when you open up and you read that very first um, chapter in Leviticus, you're going to see right away that it talk, starts talking about that burnt offering. And then it goes into um, the next offering and the next offering and the next offering. There's five of them and all the different ways they're to do it. And all those ways, they're all prefigures and types of how um, it's a, it is a um, picture of Christ's sacrifice for us. Uh, so, for instance, there's, you know, there's a, another offering like the grain offering. Well, who is the bread? The grain is, speaks of barley and wheat, you know, sustenance, bread. And who is the bread of life other than Christ? As a matter of fact, it's him that says, this is my body um, broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. So he is the bread. Uh, he is our, our sustainer and he is the, the sacrifice. And so all of those sacrifices point to Christ. So it's a picture of how we're pointing back to Exodus now. And so all of those first seven chapters in Leviticus about all the sacrifices, it's basically a reminder that, look, the one who brought you out of Egypt, Jesus, the Passover lamb, that's the only standard that I accept. I only accept perfection. So remember, God has brought them out um, he's brought them out from Egypt, but not so that they can build, they can move on and just build their own Egypt in their own promised land. That's not what he wants. He doesn't want them to just be another Egypt. Because what was the point of that? What would be the point of that? He wants them to be a peculiar people, a set apart people, a sanctified people. And so therefore he says, no, you're not going to live by the standards with which they lived in Egypt. You are going to live by my righteous standards, my holy standards for living. That's the only thing that I am going to accept. And so when he does that, that's the picture that we see in Leviticus with those first seven chapters of the perfect sacrifices. It's all a picture of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, so keep in mind, here again, it's not that they are keeping, um, they are not able to keep his standards. He is basically saying, I'm the one who's going to keep the standards by my perfect sacrifice, but now this is how your response to that is going to be. And so in Leviticus chapter 7, towards the end, um, he starts talking about how he's going to anoint um, the anointing of um, the priesthood. Okay, so we have the very first thing that, um, well, first of all, let's put that down, that we have... Um, the sacrificial system is instituted. And this is um, Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 7. And again, five, five different sacrifices all pointing to the perfect sacrifice as a prefigure. Um, the perfect sacrifice being, of course, Christ himself, sacrificed on the cross. And then you see, um, next in Leviticus, you will see um, the priestly uh, anointing. And so um, Aaron and his sons, um, the Lord has a bunch of things where he's basically saying, um, you are going to um, represent me spiritually. But, of course, this also points back to Christ, because who is our high priest? Our high priest is Christ, and he is the true anointed one. And so, again, it's, a, it's another picture of how um, they're acting out prefigures in everything that God's calling them to do. But, keep in mind that it is still, God is expecting, um, in all of this, he's expecting them to be a holy, sac sacred, sanctified, set-apart people. Again, he's not, call, he's not asking them, okay, come out, and now let's just, uh, you go back to pagan, paganism and idolatry and uh, doing all the wicked things they were doing in Egypt. No. No, you're, you're going to be doing all of these things. You're going to be doing these things that are, that are 
set apart, sanctified, called out into holiness. And so what happens next in Leviticus? We're not going to go over the whole book, but um, let's just say that there are uh, sundry, um, civil, and ceremonial, and most importantly, moral laws and codes and ordinances. And so there's basically a, a whole series of instructions that Moses is given by God to tell the people, okay, this is how you're to live in fellowship with one another. And so they have, um, basically, this is their relationship, kind of like the Ten Commandments, which were given in Exodus. Well, you could think of Leviticus kind of as a, a greater breakdown of that. It's kind of like, look, this is how you are going to interact with me. The only way that you can interact with me is through perfect sacrifice. And all these sacrifices are going to be perfect because they're all a prefigure of the true perfect sacrifice, my son. And then you have um, this concept of mediation with the priests. Now, because Christ hadn't come yet, of course, there's a priesthood, uh, and there, these priests are going, going to be the ones um, making intercession and interceding for the people, and being that go-between between God um, through the priests to the people. However, again, for the Christian, we don't have a priesthood other than the one single high priest, Jesus Christ himself. And so this is representative. Um, it's supposed to be representative or a type or a picture of that. And then, finally, you have um, how do we fellowship with one another? Well, there is all kinds of civil ceremonial laws where you know Moses gives them, by God, he gives them the rules. He's basically saying, okay, this is how you handle this situation. This is how you handle that situation. We're not going to go over all of them here, but it goes at everything from childbirth um, to business transactions to um, harvesting and crops to how they deal with their animals, how they deal with uh, contentious situations. Um, you know, if this happens, you need to do this. If that happens, do this instead. And so it's all those kinds of things about how to conduct yourself within the body of the fellowship in this new community that is has its relationship with God and its relationship with one another um, in these. Okay, so that's really the rest of Leviticus. And so, you know, there's, there's other parts to it too. Of course, Leviticus um, is where we get the, um, all the ordinances for holding the sacred assemblies, the times, the feast days, from the Passover to uh, unleavened bread and uh, first fruits and Pentecost and uh, tabernacles and atonement and I'm sorry, a feast of trumpets, tabern uh, atonement and tabernacles. I got them in the wrong order there, but that's all of, of Leviticus is all about these types of things. It's basically God saying, "Look, here's your new standards for living. You're going to live according to these standards." not according to the world's standards. You're going to be set apart, sanctified, and you're going to live according to this, not according to anything else um, by the world's um, understandings. Okay, so when we see that, let's um, look at how this corresponds to um, Lamentations. And so in Lamentations... This was the third book of the prophets. It was written by um, Jeremiah, the prophet. And so if you recall, um, looking at these progressions again, um, in our former video, we saw how that um, Moses, after Adam died, and this is very interesting to me, because after Adam died, it was actually 1,700 years. Okay, 1,700 years after Adam died, that Moses started writing the Torah. 
Okay, so 1,700 years after Adam dies, Moses starts writing the Torah, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so that's very interesting because when you see that with Adam, um, Adam's death, it's 1,700 years transpires um, after that fracture because, you know, once, once the, the sin happened um, from Adam, that created the whole mess in the first place. And then the ultimate consequence of that, you know, God told Adam, in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. So remember that um, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years like unto one day. And so within that first 1,000 years, Adam was 930 years old when he died. So he actually died within that first day uh, because when God told him that, Adam was living in God time. He wasn't living in, in this um, fallen uh, human time. He was living in God time. And so within that first, um, within that first 1,000 years, 930 years to be exact, Adam did die. And it was 1,700 years from then that Moses wrote the Torah. Now, as Israel goes through this whole progression, and they get up to this time of this glorious kingdom age, which we see uh, starting in 1 Kings, okay, so when they get up to this time of 1 Kings, when Solomon is ruling and reigning in glory, um, they had come from the sin in the garden to um, the going through the flood with Noah, to going up to Abraham and Abraham coming from Ur the Chaldeans, Chaldees and being called out um, and going through all the difficulties he, he went through with the four kings and the five kings in Genesis 14. And he goes through all this turmoil to, to, and he, he builds three altars from north, center, and south in Israel. He builds the three altars. You can read about that in Genesis. Um, and then as he does all that, and then finally he, he finally has a son at the age of uh, 100, and it's Isaac, and then God tells him to sacrifice his son, and he, he goes up, and it's a picture or a model of the crucifixion um, that, uh, that is acted out there on Mount Moriah, and then that leads to Isaac, and then Isaac to Jacob, and then Jacob goes through all of his difficulties, and he brings forth his 12 sons, and as he brings forth those 12 sons, um, there's all kinds of difficulty of them going into Egypt, and then after they come out of Egypt, Moses leads them out of Egypt, and finally uh, Joshua leads them into the Promised Land where there's giants, and they have to conquer all these giants, and they have to go through all this difficulty to finally take possession of the Promised Land. And then um, they go through these ebbs and flows of eras of, of being complacent, and then God has to let their enemies encroach in around them again, and then um, they cry out for help, and he sends them a deliverer and he delivers them and gets them back on track and they go through a season of a good time and then they fall back into complacency and they just they're going through all this stuff and finally um david comes on the scene um and deposes saul ultimately and eventually after all the difficulty they had with saul and then you finally see david ruling and reigning but um he is not qualified to build the temple uh, so he just makes the preparations for it, and finally he passes away, and he passes the baton to Solomon. And Solomon finally builds the temple and the palace, and there's this glorious time of a kingdom age uh, that they've gone through all this turmoil to reach. So it's kind of like, uh, think about it from like from the garden to glory. Okay, so when they're, you know, from falling in the garden uh, to glory, over that entire time period, um, you know, thousands of years have transpired all that difficulty that they go through, and they're finally living in this glorious kingdom age. However, what happens in the glorious kingdom age? Well, this, uh, this first king's time period here is happening a little bit before Isaiah starts prophesying. And that's why I wanted to give you the context of these prophets, the timeline. Because about a, and it's actually very interesting because you can go research it and you can see just like 1700 years after Adam died, well, Solomon sins in glory uh, because he's still in the flesh, uh, even though he's a wise king and he's done a lot of great things and God used him to do all kinds of wonderful things, bringing the kingdom age into glory. Um, but Solomon is still in the flesh, and he starts sinning 
just like Adam sinned um, with his wife, Solomon sins with his wives, plural. And so he brings in foreign wives, and just like Adam uh, followed his wife into sin, Solomon follows his wives, plural, into sin. And so because of that, um, from the, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and just write it up here. Um, and we'll say, um, from the garden to glory. Okay, so from the garden to glory, it takes a certain amount of time, but once they're in glory, just like when Adam was in perfect, um, you know, perfect idyllic paradise there with his wife in the garden, but because of their sin, it was ruined. Well, they have this perfect glorified kingdom under Solomon, but because of Solomon's sin with those wives, um, you have Solomon died. The fact that Solomon died a um, hundred and seventy years. Um, later, Isaiah started writing and prophesying the book of Isaiah. Okay, so you see the pattern there. You have Isaiah, he's writing um, his prophecies, and the, that starts the chain of events that leads to all the prophets writing. Uh, so Isaiah kicks it off in roughly 760 BC, um, and it's 170 years after Solomon died. And of course, Solomon died after he committed his sin in glory. And so uh, don't let people, people will try to tell you that Joel, um, that Joel here was written like in 800 BC. It's not true. That's a total speculation. Um, Isaiah is actually the one that kicks it off. Isaiah is the one who starts the books of the prophets, not Joel or anybody else. Okay, so uh, when you have that, then um, what we're going to see here is that just like with the fall, we have the fall here in Genesis, and it requires um, a Savior to lead them out of bondage, and then God leads them into a, a place where he intimates his new holy and righteous standards for living in Leviticus and how they're going to live their lives now in light of the perfect sacrifice of Christ by type, by prefigure. By prefigure. He does that here in Leviticus. Um, but what's happening over here with the prophets? Well, what happened in Israel after the glorified kingdom age was ruined because of Solomon's sin and people the people followed him in that sin, just like we uh, followed our first father, Adam, into that sin nature. Uh, likewise, Solomon, uh, when he sins, the people, it leads the people into sin as well, uh, of the kingdom. And so what happens is um, Solomon's uh, son, Rehoboam, he takes over and he's not, a, he's not doing good. And then Jeroboam comes in and they have a fractured kingdom. So just like we had a fracture here in the garden, we have another fracture here in Israel. And so this starts the civil war, and the northern kingdom is called the house of Israel, the southern kingdom is called the house of Judah, and you have a fracture. And so that fracture leads to um, God prophesying to them, okay, now because of this, some bad things are going to happen. And so one of the things that's going to happen, if you don't repent, is you're going to go back into bondage. And that's what the book of Jeremiah is all about. And we talked about that last time. So Isaiah is warning them that, hey, uh, you have this great kingdom, this wonderful kingdom that, you know, was that I helped you to get to. But because you sinned there, um, guess what? Now you're going to go back into bondage. Um, and Jeremiah is the prophet that explains that whole process. And we're covering this right now in our Daniel series on uh, this channel. Uh, so please check out our Daniel series and please join us on Mondays. Uh, every Monday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, we host a live streamed uh, Bible teaching on right now. We're in the book of Daniel and we just are in the middle of seeing how Jeremiah is the one that Daniel was reading regarding the 70 years. And um, Jeremiah also then 
you know, as he's going through the decades, telling all of the kings and the people what's about to happen, um, and he gets imprisoned for it. Um, but ultimately, from the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry to the end, all of everything ends up um, just like he said, and they end up being taken captive into Babylon, and eventually in 586-587 BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's armies come and besiege Jerusalem a final time, and they level the city, including the temple. And so that is what the book of Lamentations is about. Okay, so the this is interesting too because this sacrificial system, um, you might consider that Leviticus is given, um, all the instructions in Leviticus are given to Moses in the tabernacle. Okay, so you can see right at the beginning, the very first verse of Leviticus, Moses is in the portable tabernacle. That's the what served as the temple at that time. And so he's there, and he gets all the instructions for all these holiness and righteousness standards for living. He gets those while he's in the tabernacle. But what happens with Lamentations is the, the permanent temple structure, temple, is destroyed. So, what this is speaking of is that as the temple is destroyed, God is basically saying you have um, violated everything that I wanted to accomplish in having this relationship with you. You've completely violated it. You've gone completely um, away from everything that I wanted you to do. And um, instead of being this righteous and holy nation that was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, you guys have become just as pagan and idol-worshipping and as despicable as all the other nations. You've become just like them instead of you leading them to become like you. And so when you have that temple is destroyed, you have this lamentation. Um, and the lamentations begin, and basically what they're doing is they're lamenting not keeping God's holy standards because their temple is now lying in ruin. It's basically been leveled down to rubble. And so they are lamenting that they didn't keep his holy standards. And we talk about, um, you know, so here... They are no longer able to make sacrifices because the temple is destroyed. So they can't offer sacrifices anymore. And what were all the sacrifices? Uh, what were all the sacrifices um, there for? All those sacrifices were simply a picture, a prefigure, a model, or a type of the perfect sacrifice of Christ. So they could no longer model the sacrifice of Christ because they were living like idol worshipers and pagans. That's what they were doing. And so God says, I'm not, you can't have me and idolatry at the same time. You, I am going to chastise you. And so he destroys their temple so they can no longer model the sacrifice of Christ, because that relationship with him was broken. And um, if you look in Lamentations um, I believe it's four chapter four verse twenty, it talks about um, the anointing and it's like um, they're going into the pit, uh, figure, figuratively speaking. And so it's, uh, you know, it's talking here about, you know, the priestly anointing. Well, the, that anointing is uh, taken away. Um, and God's spirit is removed from the temple. 
and the temple is destroyed and so now they no longer have um, a place to have their fellowship and community with each other so they're actually taken to Babylon so God's kind of like telling them um, you know here they're off to Babylon and so it's you know you can kind of imply or infer but it's like God saying like okay you want to be idol worshiping pagans well uh, you know there's a place for that that's in Babylon uh, so why don't you go over there and spend some time uh, living like idol worshiping pagans since that's what you guys want to do and that's kind of the that's the very concept um, that's iterated here and so when you see this that um, you have God's perfect creation ruined by man's sin but God sends a savior to lead them out in the exodus God uh, then uh, intimates uh, new holy and righteous standards for living according to a prefigure of, of his son Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice that's the way they're going to live and no other way then um, you can see that progression going here well here is a counter progression this is a regression because here they were in glory but now Isaiah is telling them um, you've ruined that glory and so now everything you're gonna have to go through here's all the prophecies and then Jeremiah tells them, um, well, you came out of bondage in Exodus, but now you're about getting ready to go back into bondage, into Babylon. And then Lamentations is when it actually happens because they failed to keep his holy and righteous standards. And now they're crying and weeping and lamenting um, the fact that their glorious um, temple and their glorious city. So think about this, you know, Israel um, is the center of God's plan. And as Israel is the center of God's plan, um, Jerusalem is the center of Israel and as you have Jerusalem as the center of Israel the center of Jerusalem is the temple and as you have the temple as the center of uh, where God is meeting and interfacing with them the Holy of Holies is the true center and that's that ultimate center point of where God's interaction happens uh, with them and so now that's taken away they don't have that anymore um, and so they are lamenting the fact that they don't have that relationship with God anymore and they don't have uh, they're not allowed to do these sacrifices anymore and their anointing is taking taken away and they're sent off to Babylon and so as you uh, consider that um, it helps to see that the correspondence that is shown in the book Metacosm. It shows that there's a progression in the history, a counter progression in the prophets. And as you, you see that, it helps you to appreciate the structure and the order of the books of the Bible. And I hope that it's blessing you and helping you to appreciate the Bible and its divine structure in a greater measure, and I hope you're being edified through it. And we will see you here, there, in the air, or in the next video. God bless you. Or we'll see you in our bonus section. And as you may recall, in our intro, we talked about how... Um, the third epistle is 2 Corinthians to correspond to the second or I'm mean, the, the third epistle, 2 Corinthians, to correspond to the third history book, Leviticus, and the third prophetic book, Lamentations. And so if you see this, take a look at the correspondence here, because in 2 Corinthians there's all kinds of treasures that bring out the fullness of this understanding. So again, remember that in Leviticus, you have the tabernacle erected. In Lamentations, you have the temple destroyed, right? But in 2 Corinthians, you have the Holy Spirit is indwelt. And it talks about that a great deal, about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit here in 2 Corinthians. And so notice that in Lamentations, the temple is destroyed because they were not able to keep the law and God's holy and righteous standards externally. 
You see, it was all an external observation. It was a type. It was a model. But they weren't able to keep it because it was all outside of themselves. And so what God really wants to do is he wants the Second Corinthians aspect of this. Um, he wants the temple. Remember how we were talking about how it's the center and the center and the center and the center? Um, well, the true center is where Christ, through his Holy Spirit, dwells directly within us, and he has his precepts and his standards and his holiness and righteousness written on the tablets of our fleshly heart instead of on tablets of stone. And so when you see that, you understand that um, as Second Corinthians is talking about, well, how, how do we solve this problem? Because here, God was leading them to progression of of building something up and getting this uh, tabernacle erected and telling them, okay, here's the way you do it. But they were complete failures at holding to that and keeping it up um, down through the generations. Uh, so God destroyed it. But here, when you have the eternal God, God's Holy Spirit living and dwelling you, he will help you to keep his righteous and holy standards through uh, Christ's faithfulness and our fellowship with him in response to that. And so um, there's a bunch of other things here. Um, in Leviticus, in Leviticus 16.2, it talks about how the veil is very sacred. They're not to just go into the Holy of Holies any old time they want. They're not just trod in. Uh, they had to um, you know, go in through a series of preparations that they were to do. And uh, Aaron's sons, actually, God slays them because they are treating him uh, disrespectfully. And so you can read about that in Leviticus 16. So that veil that they are to erect in the Holy of Holies, the most precious and holy place, that's, uh, that veil is to be uh, respected. Okay, and you're not to just let anything in uh, to that veil. Well, in Lamentations, you can go read about this in 344 and 45, there's actually an interesting translation. It says covered, but it actually, the true uh, word, you can go look it up, it's in the book, uh, Lamentations 344 and 45, it talks about how God veils himself, he covers himself, he doesn't allow them to see him or allow them to approach him because he's so distraught over their... Uh, sinful behavior. But then, uh, Paul exhorts us to be bold. He says, don't do it like Moses. I don't want you to be like Moses who veiled himself, but with boldness. In 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18, go check, go read it and look it up. And it's it talks about how, you know, we're, we can come with boldness now. Why can we come with boldness? Well, because the sin has been purged from us, um, and paid for through the blood of Christ on the cross, and now we can come in um, without, the, without the veil, without respect to the veil. However, I will say that there is a sacredness to this, and that is we should not be coming into the Lord and bringing profane things into that super sacred special place within us. Um, we should protect our eye gate and our ear gate. We should protect our um, our, uh, the, the sanctity and sacredness of our relationship with God through Christ, we shouldn't just bring him into um, horrible things. We shouldn't be doing horrible things to, in the first place, but if there is anything um, that's, um, that we've gotten entangled within, um, it needs to be dealt with. It, sin needs to be confessed. We need to you know, uh, confess our sins, and he is faithful and just and, uh, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. But we are to treat that special place uh, where, we, where he dwells within us with sanctity, with sacredness, with uh, caution, with care. Um, not that we can't be bold. Of course we can be bold. Um, but um, we should respect it, not like Aaron's sons did, who just came in and said, oh, let's just offer God any old fire we want. Um, you know, and, and he slew them. And so we are to respect the sacredness but we're also uh, to be bold, right? Now, 
Um, this gets a little graphic, but in Leviticus 26, God warns them, if, if, you don't, if, if it comes time for me to chastise you and you don't heed the chastisements that I give to you, I'm not just going to punish you. I'm going to punish you seven times more than I said I would punish you. And he says it several times, and, and he says, and the punishments get worse. As a matter of fact, towards the end of that chapter, um, in Leviticus 26, 27 through 29, he basically says, it's going to be so bad that you're going to be actually eating the flesh of your own children. That's what he says. It's a Leviticus, uh, don't take my word for it. That's what God said. And then, guess what happens in Lamentations 4.10? Okay, remember, third book, third book, third book of the history, third book of the prophets. In Lamentations 4.10, um, they actually have come to that point. Um, women are, are, have boiled their own children and eaten the flesh of their own children to survive uh, the sieges of Nebuchadnezzar. And it's in Lamentations uh, 4.10. It's also in chapter 2. It talks about it. And so... This is interesting because there's a correspondence here as well. In 2 Corinthians 12, 14, Paul says, uh, Children are not responsible for the parents, but the parents for the children. So he's, he's basically saying these people had it backwards, right? They were, they were feeding on their own children to keep themselves going. Well, Paul's basically saying, um, no, that's completely backwards. Um, the children um, should not be responsible for the parents, but the parents should be responsible to take care of the children. And so, again, they had it backwards here. And then um, there's a command in Leviticus that says, don't sell yourselves into servitude to each other. Um, it's in Leviticus 25, 39. So in other words, um, God wants to, wants to make sure that within the body, within the fellowship um, of Israel at that time, but also it, applies, it can apply to the church now, don't you sell yourself into slavery uh, within the fellowship. And what ends up happening in Lamentations 1.1, 1, 1, uh, they don't just sell themselves into slavery to each other, they actually sell their slaves into servitude to foreigners. They're actually sold into slavery uh, to a foreign nation. And then, but what does Paul say here in 2 Corinthians 11.23, because this is beautiful, and it basically says that um, it intimates the concept that Paul is a bondservant of Christ, and ultimately he's the foremost bondservant. In other words, he's completely sold himself into the service of the kingdom. And so that is really what Christians are called to do. Um, in whatever walk of life you're in, whether you're, you know, whether you're in full-time professional ministry or not, uh, if you're a Christian, you're a full-time minister because everywhere you go, whether you're an auto mechanic or a technician, or a lawyer, or a businessman, or um, a teacher, or anything that you might be. Um, you're representing the kingdom. And so you should be doing your job um, and, your and fulfilling your role in society, whatever it might be, as though you're doing it for Christ. And you should be a bondservant and do uh, whatever your role in society is uh, with that attitude. Okay, so it's, you don't have to be a Paul and go evangelize the whole world to do this. Uh, you can do it right there in your own life um, with whatever God has called you to do in, in society, in your community, um, vocationally or whatever else, in whatever, whatever manner that um, um, your life has uh, take, taken shape. Um, you can be a bondservant of Christ. And it's a good attitude to have like Paul's. That to be the foremost, you know, he, he uh, really was the foremost bondservant. I mean, he, he gave it all. Uh, he gave up his whole life for the sake of Christ and the kingdom and the church. So um, I hope uh, this video and this teaching has blessed you to see the correspondence between the third books, third book of the history, Leviticus, third book of Lamentations of, of the prophets, and the third book of the epistles, 2 Corinthians, there's a very clear, very strong um, correspondence between them. And um, we'll continue this series next time with the fourth books, which is going to be um, the book of Numbers, Ezekiel, and Galatians, and the amazing correspondences that we see with those. So until then, hope you've enjoyed this video as always. God bless you, and we'll see you here, there, 
or in the air or in the next video. God bless you.